Amen. Amen. Christ is among us. He is Christ shall be. So it was uh, a little over three years ago when my mom passed away, and um, fairly quickly thereafter, I dived into genealogy. And I think I've told you about a little bit about this before, maybe last year. I was bringing up this is the Sunday of the genealogy of Christ. And uh, genealogies are very interesting and very fun if you can do them. And they can also be extremely frustrating because you find um, all kinds of twists and turns that you didn't expect and places where they're, they're, the historical record completely goes silent or it gets confusing. We have families where people think it's a great idea to name their children the same name and their children the same name. And, and, and then you don't know which one is which anymore because there's too many of them. Uh, and then you find out that sometimes there's a, adoptions. And that then kind of makes you wonder, OK, so now what am I doing? And how does this all connect? For a long time, I was fascinated by my mom's maiden name through my maternal grandfather, because there's an interesting history through that line. But no one ever talked about it. I wondered why, and finally kind of teased it out. I found out that my grandfather's father, he had been adopted. And it's not clear what his name ended up even being, um, because he also not only was adopted, but he kind of abandoned my maternal great grandma. So it's like complete loss. That whole line biologically is lost. But I have the whole line of the name from the adopted family. So do I take the adopted family for my own line? Do I embrace that as my own family? Or do I realize, no, I don't really belong to them. It was just kind of a, a gaffe along the way somehow. And I think a lot of people that struggle with that, who have adoptions in their families and trying to find their family histories, will know what I'm, will know what I'm talking about. And so it's very challenging. And there's, there's interesting things where you find that you can come to an ancestor through different routes, uh, especially when it's more a more enclosed community and there's more people, you know, they're not marrying people from far and wide. There's a smaller community. So, can have this set of ancestors and then they come back together and guess what? They marry again, generations down the road. There's nothing scandalous because it's been like 14 generations. And that happens. And I have that too in my genealogies, which is pretty neat. And the third thing is if you can get your genealogy to tack into anybody who has royalty <laughs> of any sort in, in uh, at least Europe, I don't know about other countries that they have this level of tracking, but in Europe they do. And once you can like link in, you're you're you can then run all the way back to Adam. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking because I'm not actually because they, those royal lines they all link at some point to some Jewish royalty, and the Jewish royalty, as you know, if you read the Gospel of Luke, you can track it all the way back to Adam, right? So it's it's a pretty interesting thing. And that's where we get to this genealogy of Jesus. This is also a very complicated bit of genealogy that we're presented with in the Gospel of Matthew. It's made even more complicated by the fact that the Gospel of St. Luke in chapter 3 presents an alternate genealogy, which again, if you realize you can go through different tracks, it's not that necessarily a big deal, but it has to link up somewhere, and it doesn't actually really link up because it has two different fathers for Joseph, if that's what it's saying, which it may not. So you're not confused, don't feel bad. It's very confusing. And so people have come up with different theories about why the genealogies are different from one another. I know, it's sad. <laughs> One says that Matthew is tracking the genealogy of Joseph, which seems to be the case, and the other suggests, well, it's actually tracking the genealogy of Mary, but then we have a problem with that because the earliest tradition about Mary's parents is that it's Joachim and Anna, and that's not who's listed in Luke. 
So that kind of is a problem too. Then you get the whole idea of leveret marriage, where if somebody dies without having a child, then, the, then a kinsperson will come and marry the, marry the widow and raise up children, and that child is considered both the child of the biological father, but also of the father on, whom's, on whose behalf they are being raised, okay? Because that's how you trace inheritances, which was important. And we don't think that's such a big deal, right? Because it's, we think we don't think very far. But in a time in history in which, you know, life expectancy was often very low, and the chance of you seeing your children's children, I mean, they prayed to be able to see their children's children, because it wasn't an easy thing to necessarily do, to live that long and to see your offspring. And very often people were dying, so the question of inheritance became complicated. How do you trace that? And so that's all in there, in the, in the Gospels and the genealogies of Jesus. So that's all my preface. Today I just want to focus on basically one of those names, of all those names that you heard. And that is the figure of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, what does Zerubbabel have to do with anything? That's a weird name. It means begotten in Babel, or, or seed of Babel. Because, to understand the story of Zerubbabel, you have to go back a couple generations to Jeconiah, which is at that second, third, second group of 14 in the genealogy of Jesus. Jeconiah is the last king of Judah. From David to Solomon, to Jeconiah is this line of kings. And that's a pretty solid one of these royal genealogies. After that point, it starts to get a, a bit muddled and messy, obviously. But within, within the Jewish world, there are still people who trace themselves to these lines. So they're not lost. <coughs> and there's no evidence that at any time anybody argued against the genealogy of Joseph presented in Matthew as being incorrect. Jews could have easily said, this is just somebody made this up. We know the names, and none of those names fit. Because they knew, and nobody ever argued against it. They knew who Joseph was, they knew his lineage, they knew he was of the tribe of David and the lion of the kings, and so forth. So, leave that aside. Zerubbabel is a grandchild of, of Jeconiah the last king. Jeconiah was uh, a sinner. And he did what his, you know, like his evil fathers before him and was unfaithful to the Lord. And as a result of that, the Lord brought finally judgment upon the kingdom of Judah in the time of Jeconiah in what is known as the deportation to Babylon. When the Babylonians came in, Nebuchadnezzar and that group of bad guys came in and conquered the land and captured the royal family and all the nobles and the wealthy people and dragged them away from Jerusalem and took them as hostages and prisoners to, um, to Babylon. Which you see in, you know, if you remember your Game of Thrones stories, there's a lot of that going on. People getting dragged here and there and made to live with somebody they don't like and all that. And it's, it's always an ugly affair. But the Babylonians also got judged by God shortly thereafter by the Persians who came along. And the Persians, uh, Darius, uh, the king of the Persians, he liked Zerubbabel enough. He said, okay, you guys aren't so bad. I'm not going to make you stay here in exile. Tell you what, I'll make you a deal. You, you do good for me, I'll do good for you. Go back to Jerusalem, and I won't let you be king, but I'll let you be governor. And so Jeconiah is the last of the kings of Judah, but Zerubbabel comes back and is functionally the ruler. Now, there was a, there was a challenge in this, because in the time of Jeconiah, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied against him, saying, the Lord says, let this man, Jeconiah, be counted as one who has no sons, who doesn't prosper, and none of his offspring will have the throne of David. And so people thought that that meant, oh, okay, so that line now is cut off from running as a source of the Messiah. So the Messiah can't come from the line of 
the kings. It's called the curse of the Solomon of God. But the Jews themselves have gone back and said, well, that really only applies to Jeconiah and his generation. Because Zerubbabel comes a couple generations later and God chooses him. And it's found in, the, in this prophecy of Haggai. That where Jeremiah prophesies that the Lord says, Jeconiah, you're like a ring that the Lord casts off his hand and throws away. But then Haggai the prophet, the Lord comes and says, Zerubbabel, you are like a signet ring that I have chosen for my right hand. Now, what's that? What's the meaning of the ring? Well, uh, you may again know this from, from your from your history books and things, or maybe you saw it in the, in the film Dune where he presses the ring into the wax. That's the seal of the signet ring there of a leader, of a king, or in Dune, a duke. And the signet ring has the image of the king. Not necessarily a picture, but the, the symbol or whatever it is. And so it's a sign that the king's hand has touched this and has made it so. So Jeconiah, as a king of Judah, was serving as God's signet ring on earth. That is the image of God's authority on earth for the people of God, the one who had the authority to act in the name of God. So the king himself is the, is, is the symbol, is the seal of God's authority. But he loses that authority. Zerubbabel then is restored to him as the signet. And so Zerubbabel comes back to Jerusalem with his family and also a figure who becomes very important as well, his partner, Joshua, or Yeshua, the high priest. Or Jesus, the high priest, actually, you could say as well. And together, these two figures rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, that which becomes the second temple, which then initiates this long, important history, which if you take my Wednesday night class, you'll heard a lot about. Um, and there was a lot of messianic hope around these two figures of Zerubbabel and Joshua. And there was the hope that they were in some way the chosen ones or the anointed ones of God who will usher in the kingdom. But that was not what God was saying. But he was saying that through their actions and through their deeds would be revealed the Messiah eventually. And so in Zechariah we see Joshua the high priest being, being this figure seated by the branch of David, who is an image of the Messiah, and they think, okay, so Zerubbabel is the Messiah, but no, Zerubbabel is just the signet ring. He's just the image of the king. It's not until Christ comes that the kingdom is returned, that the king returns. The, Tolkien wrote the third book, The Return of the King. Uh, he wasn't making it an allegory, but he was borrowing we're certainly borrowing from the messianic hope of the Bible that one day the king would return and Christ comes like a ranger from the north, you know, somebody <laughs> unknown and, and, uh, uh, and, and threatening the powers that be will come. And they had tried other kingdoms, right? The Maccabees, when they cast, the Greeks came out and kicked out the Persians and then the Maccabees rose up against the Greeks because they defiled the temple and then this is where the whole Hanukkah story. But they set up a kingdom, but they had no authority because they weren't of the tribe of David. And so their kingdom fell, and then Herod came. And that was bad news, right? Herod was a bad guy. He wasn't even a Jew. He was an Edomite. So Christ comes in the time when, in which all of this has been prepared. And he is both king which Zerubbabel could not be. And he's also high priest at the same time. So the figures of Zerubbabel and Joshua become, their, the messianic hope for both of them find their fulfillment prophetically, finally in the coming of Jesus Christ, who is both king and high priest. The Messiah has to be like that. And Christ himself is described as what? The seal of the image and likeness of God, the seal of the Father, that he's, his, in his humanity, his humanity is that wax that's been pressed with the image of God and reveals it. 
the king underneath, right? So he has all the authority, he has all the power, he has all the identity of the Messiah. Which then makes this whole genealogy in Matthew, coming back to this that we read today, a really weird story to tell at the beginning of your gospel. Because it goes through a very, very lengthy uh, effort to show the exact lineage to Joseph. And then proceeds to completely destroy it by saying, Joseph's not the father. <laughs> but it's the fulfillment of another prophet, Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child whose name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. But Christ, as the adopted son of Joseph, receives the inheritance of Joseph receives all the legal rights because the genealogy again it's not about biological transfer because that's too complicated to really track half the time and there's a bunch of people missing from those lists even Zerubbabel was not the son of Shealtiel he was the son of Pediah the brother of Shealtiel but he was raised by Shealtiel the son of Jeconiah so you see the whole thing is wacky as soon as you start picking at it but if you understand it as the inheritance of the kings and the inheritance of the kingdom coming down, then you understand the whole point. Christ receives it even though he's not the actual son of Joseph, by logic. But he is the legal son of him nonetheless. So brothers and sisters, here's the good news. The same thing applies to you. Now that I've told you all of this, <laughs> Don't worry too much. If you have the chance and you can do genealogy, go for it. It's awesome. Nowadays, we have ancestry DNA, and they'll tell you like all kinds of stuff that we couldn't know before, for better or for worse. And there's people being able to find their families that they never even knew they had across the globe. It's amazing stuff. But here's the most important part of that, is that it doesn't actually matter anymore. Because when you become united to Christ, you become part of his family too. You become one of those lines of the kings. And you become an heir, a co-heir with Christ of the promises that began with Abraham, that continued with David, that were prophesied through Zerubbabel, and so on. And you become one of God's chosen. You become a ring on his right hand. You become the image and likeness of God more fully than you ever knew. That's what we've been created to be, actually. This Christmas, Christ is born, and we glorify him. But through Christ, we are able to be reborn as children of God, not just children of Abraham and David, but as, or even of Adam but of God. And so you receive the adoption as sons and daughters with everything that that entails. Nothing is kept out of that. The inheritance is yours. Do not neglect it. Do not forget the great gift that is going to be to you this Christmas. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Christ is a witness. He is a witness.